But Kula, I want you to tell us about the SABC collection. Thank you, Wilhelm, <clears throat> and greetings, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's, a wonderful, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you to Strauss for his opportunity, for this opportunity. I'm also delighted to be joined by Carl Nell. Has he come on yet? Lawrence Lemoyne, Paul Emanuel, and Simon Klingetwa, who will be speaking about their work a bit later, whose work also forms part of the collection. So for more than half a century, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, the SABC, has been acquiring artworks informally. Um, but before going into any detail as a starting point, I'd just like to out outline the purpose of the SABC art collection. First and foremost, its aim has been to acquire a body of artwork that represents the creative output of South African visual artists, both historical and contemporary. Then, of course, within the broad framework of the objectives of the National Broadcaster, the collection is also used for educational purposes, not just as a way to develop an understanding of the visual arts, but to further social engagement and debate. As far as my history with the SABC's collection is concerned, I was officially appointed as curator in 1997, three years after the corporation's restructure in 1994. But I first came into contact with the SABC in 1966 when I was working independently. My view was that as a state-owned enterprise, it was in theirs and the public's interest to curate an exhibition of selected work from the collection at that time. With Mary Jane Darrell, my then business partner, we curated an in-house exhibition, which by public demand was re-exhibited soon after. The visitor's book was very complimentary except for one comment, of course, and not surprisingly, which read, where's the Kendall Gears? But that was just the beginning. And it must be said that it took a while before significant funds were allocated towards the acquisition of artworks and exhibitions that sought to be representative of South Africa's new democracy. Before long, I was actively lobbying um, um, for, uh, sorry, before long I was actively lobbying for the acquisition of important work and indeed just to keep the collection going and have continued to do so over the years. As the value of the collection began to estimate, I'm talking about coming close to 200 million rands, it was a bit of a light bulb moment. At last, there was a clear recognition that this was something worth investing in. And thanks to the vision and support of the Nicholson at the time, the then CFO in 2003, we secured a budget of over 50,000 rand for the very first time. Um, and we went on to curate the, to curate the award-winning exhibition, Making Waves, which travelled extensively. And over 15 years, or since 1997, a primary objective has been to acquire work by black artists and other artists that were previously underrepresented in the collection. Until then, the seminal works of the SABC collection, art collection, which had originated during the apartheid years, was to my understanding recommended by the late Professor Karen Scovran, who was then Head of Fine Art and History of Art at UNISA. As you will see, Shortly, the work I will be showing in the earlier part of the collection is a reflection of European influences. The collection today is very different, ever evolving, and its significance in these deeply uncertain times for the world cannot be understated. It remains one of the most culturally and historically significant, significant in South African art, and I would argue the wider world. I went in about 2000, I went to Cuba um, thinking that I was going to see the best of the best, that I had not yet eaten the visual enough in South Africa. And I was so wrong. We have got such amazing artists in this country. And it's a no wonder people abroad are looking to South Africa. It is a distinct and diverse and a vital expression of visual and creative energy that shines a light on and reveals the paradoxes ever present here. As a rich 
robust and coveted archive of the nation's cultural output. It's telling that contemporary artists wish to be represented in the collection and not just for the reasons me just mentioned. Research has shown that the art market prices are largely determined by institutional endorsement. And this has a significant impact on the career of an artist as well as market value of their work. And just as an aside, it is known that a lot of collectors have also built institutions and foundations to validate their collections. That is quite telling. Some people might even use it to manipulate, to manipulative ends. And this is also why state supported museums and institutions are vital. A need for autonomy and non-censorship for collecting is showcase and showcasing is equally vital. Let me give you a few examples. The SABC was one of the first to, uh, of, of collecting, was one of the first to acquire the work of esteemed contemporary artists, Diane Victor, Paul Emanuel, and Lawrence Lemoyne, who are now all globally recognized. It has also bolstered the stature of once neglected artists, Demili Fanny, Julian Matar, Dorothy Kay, and Fred Page from the Eastern Cape in particular. The, acquisitions of these work, the acquisition of these works by the SABC has profoundly impacted their value to the extent that even they are now beyond the corporation's budget. It's worth noting too that collectors are guided by a good eye as well as institutional judgment and have closely monitored the, monitored the artworks that we have bid on in the past. The SABC collection is not committee driven and I've worked closely in particular with retired academic Graham Neem, um, also Bronwyn Lace who's left and Alex Dodd, our writer, and you'll look out for our website. Over the years, the SABC collection has also curated some seminal exhibitions, both national and in-house at the SABC's headquarters in, in, in Auckland Park. So among these award-winning, was the award-winning Making Waves, which, which um, um, Wilhelm has mentioned, started at JAG, traveled to the National Art Festival and then to the castle in Cape Town. Scape was an in-house exhibition and then we were invited by Vanza and that later was shown in Durban for COP17, which is the 20, was the 2011 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Aluta Continua, in-house exhibition, also one of the many themes in the collection, which I'll talk about more. Uh, the struggle continues indeed. The 2010 World Cup sells to do with identity. Joburg, my Joburg, which was curated for the Business Day Lounge at the Johannesburg Art Fair last year was very popular. So during this talk, I will be showcasing some of the works in the collection and by no means all of them, which saddens me. And I'm going to be sharing some of its overarching themes. So a bit later in this talk, as I mentioned, we'll be, be hearing from the artists, um, a few of the artists here. So perhaps we can go to the pre-1994 slide to Wilhelm and we can yeah. just... Uh, be, before I change the slides, I just want to draw your attention to the title, Stop Crying Mother. And I'm sure Kula will talk about that when we get to that particular slide. <clears throat> Right. So, I, as I said, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I think this, this work, um, um, Seated Arab Man, is any day as strong as all of the, the Irma Stearns that I've seen go through auction houses. I just really love it. And then we've got to the next slide, three and four, we've got two still lives in the collection. Yeah. Irises and still life with fruit, if you can show those, Wilhelm. Uh, also, just to say that this uh, work I, uh, I, uh, I, I borrowed from the SABC for the 2003 Irma Stern retrospective at Standard Bank. And then slide number three, Wilhelm, I'm sorry, but I didn't find the invitation to the 1996 exhibition so that I could wave it and say hello to you. <laughs> And no then problem. one is slide number five, Mapoho women. Um, and then slide number six, what was native girl. Um, and then slide, we move on to slide number seven, Pionief. Um, You all know, we've got quite a few Pionefs in the collection, one of which 
was stolen, as you probably all know, and that I think was a very, it was a, a time that catapulted Pierre Neff's um, prices in the art world. Um, going to slide nine, another Pierre Neff. In slide 10, I think husband and wife was the, black, the first black artist bought, and I think was also recommended by Karen Scabron. And then Maggie Loebscher, we've got some beautiful examples of that Maggie Loebscher. So I, um, I do at this stage must tell, I will probably, if I don't get the time to remember to, to anyone is welcome to come to the SABC on tours or get groups together to come and view all of these works. Yeah, and and certainly on. this is uh, one work uh, some of you might know that Strauss and Company is hosting a special exhibition of Gladys Mugudlandlu and Maggie Laubscher at the Turbine Art, Fest, uh, Art Fair this year. And I've already asked Kula to, to borrow this one. Thanks for, um, for reminding me to mention that too. So here we have Walter, two examples of Walter Batters, number 12 and 13, where Walter Batters um, uses the palette knife quite extensively. And I have seen quite a few coming up on auction recently, Wilhelm. What were the prices that these fetched? Uh, yeah, ones? today they, they routinely sell anything between 200, 300, 400,000 rand. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then an Ampenberger number slide number 14, another very delicate, beautiful work. And then um, slide number 15 is one of my favorites so delicate and fragile, just love it. So, and here we've got Slecht and Nice by Anton van Vaux. Alistair, if you're there, I'm sure you will love this one. <laughs> and then a lovely Cecil um, Scottness. We've got quite a few of these wood carvings in the collection. So now I'm going to move through to um, post-1997. Here is a work with the 50,000 rand that I was given to buy work. I mean, obviously, I couldn't easily go to galleries and not even the contemporary work. Um, we, could, we couldn't afford any work. This, this was a, a work that was destined for a dustbin and it was saved. And we paid something like 1,200 rand for it. But that's just, that's the market then. Um, it is quite a torturous work. I think the red ballpoint paint is also, there's quite a lot of um, hard, hard pain there. I, I think that if you look, we look at the early works of Dumili Fernies and Julian Mattal, and even Prilla as we come along, I just want you to notice the hands, um, workers' hands and large feet. There's a gnarledness about this work and many other, others that we see in the collection. We move on to um, slide number 19. I just want to honor Lindsay Mandela's passing a few days ago. And this work um, carries a, a lot of sorrow. I mean, her loss, the loss of her life is, is carrying a lot of solo, sorrow. And I just want to also bring to attention Bill Ainsley's delicate rendering of her. There's something so angelic and Pieta-like about her face. I, uh, I'm surprised at the date uh, uh, because at this stage he all, uh, worked almost exclusively in an abstract manner. But then I remembered that uh, this is what his very early work in the early 1960s actually looked like. Yeah. Uh, you, what are you saying that you th think this work was in the 1960s? No, no, no. Uh, the date is 1987, but it reminds me of his style oh, of the early 60s. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Wilhelm. So the next, again, another Jamili Fanny. Here again, there are three. It's called three. Well, it's not called Three Hands. It's untitled, but you'll see Three Hands. Mm. Um, so, um, and then we go to the title of the exhibition, Stop Crying Mother. Um, this work really moved me enormously during this time of the pandemic and um, George Floyd's I Can't Breathe. Time seemed to collapse, the past 
came into the present and the present comes into not knowing what tomorrow is going to be. And then, and also all the protests that started in Minneapolis after that. There's something about um, this erect, strong child. This is obviously Cyprian Shilaka's memory, in my view, where, he, where he's carrying all the weight of his mother and his, the mother's head is just about rolling off her shoulders. There's one tear rolling down um, the child's face and the tears of the mother, is, is, is deeply etched in her face. Her mouth is even a dark void that just goes, you go into some sort of abyss. And it's, it's quite a metaphor for me for the whole collection in some way because it's one of the strong themes in our collection in that we focus quite a lot on predicament. There's something even in the colours of the collection of the artists, it's bled of colour, it's bled of that, there's something sorrowful about it. It does not mean that we're just full of pathos and pain, there is wit in the collection and maybe we'll come across one or two slides of that nature. So we also, I also just want to mention there's quite a lot of spirituality um, that I've actually um, encountered when I put these slides together. I just need to say something quickly before I forget, that there's something about collections that, 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 is, that is really important. It's important for all of us because you, it, it, you, it's like getting a whole story of humanity, of a country, of a place, universally relevant as well. One can have a library of books that can take a lifetime to read them. But when you engage visually in one space, even if it's two hours, you, you can move one deeply. I found that putting these slides together did that for me. And I just wanted to mention it before I forget. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. Similarly, um, we've got um, Lucas Satoli's Leopard, which again, you know, is, there's this, in K, this, this frame that is so tight up against the leopard, much like Stop Crying Mother. There's no room to move, it's tight, it's holding you. Um, and then going to the next slide, is, I'm moving quite fast because I'd like you to see the work. I'm sure you, you know, that's just one way of going, here's um, Positive Black Buddha by Kendall Gears. Again, I think this, was, this work marked the shift in Kendall Gears' life he's, he's making. He's always been a very tough, outspoken, angry, um, contrarian in his work. And here was a transitional work. And when I spoke to Kendall recently when he was in the country, he said, absolutely, that was one of the works. So we're very lucky to have it. Slide number 24, we're looking at Jürgen Schaderberg's Sophia Town Removals. Um, just notice how the, um, the, the, um, the removal, the, how, how the, the, the man is looking straight at the photographer's eyes. It is quite haunting. And there's something about needing to be registered, to be seen. Andrew Mochuadi, again, the subject of spirituality, um, religion and community. Um, slide number 26, another one of my favorites is Albert Adams's Pieta, um, which has gone um, on loan to Wham and to Stellenbosch, to his um, Prella, again, if you compare um, the Albert Adams and the Prella hands, there's just something that's not quite of this world. It's even like the Prella is something like a Greco's work. Um, it's probably the closest that I can say again is it's a spiritual rendering for me. Similarly, Dan Rechotta, Mystery of Space. I'm going through all of these works that surprised me so much. And then um, slide number 29 is Robert Hodgins. Similarly, you know, he's always been quite a naughty, quite a cheeky, challenging person. And this is quite meditative. Is he here? Is he contemplating what it's like? Is there an afterlife? 
I don't know, but it's called Four Figures for Assisting, and it speaks to me in that way. Next slide is um, uh, another Alexis Prella. It's quite, it's a very sensual work. Um, I probably should have put it further down, um, but it's very, very beautiful. Uh, but ironically, we move on to slide number 31, which is Churchill Madikida's virus one. We have three of them. Churchill's sister died of HIV AIDS, and he, he made it his business to go and he looked at so many viruses um, to try and understand it, I suppose. And it was quite a shock and a surprise when, because this work is in the foyer at the SABC at the moment, and I thought, Jesus, this is the pandemic here all over again and a, a different one. So again, that thing of how art can be so relevant today when it was made yesterday and it'll be relevant tomorrow. And it's one thing I think I can feel that I can know about tomorrow. I don't know it, but you might know that this could happen again and again. And if we move on to the next slide, Walter Altman, that was hanging next to, is hanging next to the leader in the foyer. Similarly, this is the, the inner, you know, the raw insides of, of, of suffering in some horrendous way. Um, I also think of Walter Altman because of his, um, he works a lot with metal and he bends and works at it. There's something quite, quite suffered about um, Walter Altman's um, way of being, but he can also make the most delicate things with wire. And the fact that this is red and, and angry and upset, and he's buckling at the knees, and yet he's got to keep going. Anyway, let's go on. I'm probably spending a lot of time here. The neglected, um, um, at the time, I thought Fred Page, we'd, we'd buy him on auction for 12,000 rand. Uh, we've got three of them in the collection, and we've got this ghostliness where the black and the brown merge um, together and this, this figure is, is hauntingly there. It's a state of mind that I can identify with. Um, and then to slide number 34, which is um, also currently in the foyer, it's not a very good um, image. So I've put slide number 35 together just so that you can get a closer look at it. It's called Falling Man. And this was also bought Wilhelm from your gallery at AOP. Yeah. Um, it was, I think, um, um, Robert Hodgins' first attempt at an installation. I also surprisingly, wonderfully surprised it's a black and white, which is also not something that I, because I think Robert Hodgins revels in color. Also, ironically, this work uh, came to me afterwards when I was having quite a hard time with the odd work being censored, that, I, that Falling Man was appropriate to what happens with people in power. And certainly it happened a few times at the SABC. So it was my own little private joke, um, especially when, if we move on to the next slide, if you, um, that slide by Aubrey Fourie, also very accidentally was put on the top 28th floor and it was the end of the world. Well, of course, these themes don't pertain to the SABC. They only, they pertain to all of us. Um, um, and then if we go to slide number 37, this work was, um, I was told to take this work down, probably, well, I know so, it's got a, you know, it's a penis and that's what, what caused problems. And then similarly with um, the next slide um, um, was also, I was told to take it down because Wim Boerte, you know, this work by Wim Boerte was upsetting people. You know, interestingly over the years, there was a lot of lobbying and a lot of talking about work. And, and I had said to the CEO at the time, well, if we take one work down or two works down, we were gonna take the whole ex exhibition down. I was actually rebelling in some sort of way. Um, and we did do that. We took all the exhibition down in the foyer completely. And it was just so wonderful to hear how staff members were moaning about the work being taken down. Whereas previously, um, there was a sense that it was, you know, quite rough to live with. Yes, it's not an easy collection. It's hard hitting. So that, that was heartening to, to have had the staff asking for work back. And here um, we can move on to slide 39, um, 
this um, with these works by um, Jeremy um, Irons. We have um, works in the collection now that span a hundred years, which is really nice to know. And they're very beautiful, delicate works. We move on to Joe Radcliffe's work. And, you know, I, I find this a very moving work and her relationship with dogs, her dogs has always been very strong. And it also echoes the cruelty of being abandoned. It's a very loud and clear thing. I can even hear, I can't breathe. There's, there's all of this for me, the predicament of, you know, what we experience. This work by Diane Victor, um, The Sleeping Dead. Um, Diane Victor was in Italy at the time, and this I think was the first one of her works that came into an art collection. And it was, are we looking at the time, by the way? Um, okay, I've got to move Don't fast. Don't worry, we have a couple more minutes. <clears throat> okay, so Diane Victor's, um, well, she said no, in this little town in Italy, village, in Italy, she was absolutely horrified that nobody even knew where South Africa, where South Africa was. So that's why we've got those sleeping dead up at the top, hovering over this Italian town. Also, interestingly here, it's one of the few works of Diane's that I see with colour. The next work is also by Diane, The Fragility of Life for Me, um, um, The Stained Guards, where she uses smoke. Um, you know, it's quite interesting to see how uh, using smoke to draw and talking about gods and that invisibility, that energy that, that you need to try and give shape to in some way. Anyway, we go on to the next slide, slide 43. This is a work by Ken Oosterbrook. He was a press photographer. He died in 1994, just prior to that. And... Um, it was the first press photography exhibition that actually made art, an art gallery. There was something unbelievably amazing about his work. And he formed part of the Bang Bang Club, which the next work is Greg Marinovitz. Um, and to even go back to Ken Westerbrook and Greg Marinovitz, that, that press photography has actually made made its way into the visual arts in the way, and I'm really glad that it has. Vitz, for instance, um, and I know this because this exhibition was curated by um, Mary Jane Darrell and myself at the time. Um, and you have the first um, press photography work that was sold was to Wham. Um, and there was, um, I know that David Goldblatt donated works to Wham um, during that time or before then. Anyhow, I just needed to say it fits in well with the um, theme of predicament in the collection. Um, Greg Marinovitz, you know, and, and there was also, um, I can't remember his name, Kevin Carter gassed himself during that time as well, he, not too far from William Nickel Highway, and Joao Silva, also part of the Bang Bang Club, I think his legs were blown off. So there's something close to my heart with those images. And then if we can move to slide number 46, three shadow figures, Kittredge, who needs no introduction and a beautiful work. And if we move um, then to slide number 47, Ishmael, um, eyes wide shut. This work was um, bought just before our first exhibition um, in, 2004 at the Johannesburg Art Gallery, just before his brother died. So it was a very sad moment for Santu. And then Tracy Rose is the next one. Again, I would, had wanted Tracy to also, I was also, also invited her to come and talk today, but we couldn't, I couldn't get hold of her properly and she phoned me last night and we had a long conversation about her, 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 her life beyond the political, and that's the spiritual. If you look at this work, Maki Tu, which is Marie Antoinette, Let Them Eat Cake, there, and there's Tracy puts herself in her work often, and she's hovering above the shacks, but there's something again clearly spiritual about the way she's suspended. And, and the next slide equally, uh, 
her merging of Christian Catholicism and 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 I think it's the Muslim religion where she's this has been our um, one of our um, almost our second logo and I'll show this to you I don't know if you can see it um, where it's been on all our catalogs of making ways we had three different versions of it so if we go move on um, quite fast now to slide number 51 and, and number 50. There's a bit of wit where Robert Hodgins is saying, I'm the widow, I'm in mourning, okay? And she's tapping her foot away there. And you can see she's surrounded with all this red. There's nothing terribly mournful about her. And then I put it next to slide number 51, Wilhelm, because you like it so much. And I sort of thought to myself, actually, I wonder if David owned a motorbike. Sam, you might know from the bag factory days. <laughs> no, okay. So we will move on to the next slide, um, which is also another very strong work, Peter Hugo. It wasn't very popular in, in the foyer at the lift lobby. It used to freak a lot of people out. But again, Peter Hugo had an exhibition and my advisor at the time, Graham Neem, said to me, yeah, this is the work we've got to get. All the other works are not challenging the photographer. These guys are looking straight at the photographer and Jones, they don't think you can do what you like to me. And he's absolutely right. So the next one is David Goldblatt. We took a long time before we actually got these works. They were vintage works. Um, there's something about these works during the apartheid years that David Goldblatt managed to get the, tangibly the sinisterness of that time. Um, I'm going to we move on to slide number 54, 55 and 56 because they're all thematically um, similar. The one um, we've got David Goldblatt's cells and we, we've we need to thank the late David Goldblatt. He donated that work to the SABC just before he died. So we have that. I'm sorry, it's not a very good photograph and that's the reason. The next work is Joe Ratcliffe's Flat Plus, um, 2nd of June, Drive-By Shooting. And I'm going to read what our writer, Alex Dodd, who's written extensively for our website, and other texts, because it's very relevant. So it, she says, Flat Class is one of Joe Ratcliffe's major works and is particularly pertinent for the SABC collection because of its newsworthiness and historical significance. The SABC has extensively covered the Truth Commission and the Third Force, and this work, was visu work visually records and engages with Flat Class, a notorious site of torture and interrogation a particularly deep wound in South Africa's recent dark history. The link between broadcast content and the art collection is therefore direct. This work also relates thematically to other works in the collection, which makes curatorial sense in terms of future exhibition content. Okay, so we can move on again. Um, uh, can got... I, just in the interest of time, I, I suggest we move on to, to our guests and then we can come back to the couple of slides so, that uh, we're going to skip over. Okay, okay. okay. So um, as you move to the guests, go right down. Oh gosh, there's more and more. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm going to. Is Carl here? Will help? Um, Yes, I'm here. Sure? I am here. Okay, Thank there we go. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Carl. Hi. <laughs> okay, so Carl, um, I probably needs no no big introduction. He's a great curator. Curated a lot of shows. Lectured at Wits. I don't know how many years. Thirty-seven. Uh, Thirty-seven. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, um, and you've got books. Um, you've got an amazing art collection. Your advisor still to WAM on the, for the African art collection and internationally. Um, you um, are collect, have been and are in collections at Berkeley and where else? Where, just remind me. Um, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and uh, the Smithsonian and the British Museum and out there. <laughs> out there. 
So, um, welcome, Carl. I'm so relieved to see you because we couldn't get you earlier. So, yeah. the SBC acquired, um, can we go, yes, this large drawing parallel will shortly after your 1986 exhibition, Quiet Lives, at the Witz Art Museum, just prior to your departure to study at the University of California in Berkeley on a Fulbright scholarship. So, Carl will be um, um, talking about his work and in relation to Paul Stockport's work later. So, Carl, I'm going to let you start so that we don't. Um... Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here and to see the extraordinary range of the collection. Uh, it, uh, it really makes a, a, a very powerful statement. And on the screen on the right hand side <clears throat> is a work of mine called Nimbus, which was on the Quiet Lives exhibition, uh, which was a series of large drawings which uh, pushed the boundaries of the Western tradition of still life as a genre. And uh, the series of works juxtapose objects of significance uh, creating a series of uh, visual narratives. And the drawing here captures a dark chair and a bow uh, drawn accurately. The, the, the work is, uh, is uh, you know, just under two meters by two meters. So there's a kind of intimacy in looking at those objects when you're in front of it. And um, there is a sense of accuracy in the drawing of the bow and of the details which are evocatively set off uh, against a, a background drawing of mine which was called the gleaming ones and um, the the gleaming ones was a series of drawings which were based uh, on images drawn from the mind's eye and so this work really combines both the external and internal modes of perception combined in one body of work and the series of still lives were really a journey inwards. And uh, so that was the preceding body of work to Parallel Worlds, which you see on the uh, left-hand side. And um, the, the drawing is about three meters long, so it, it, does, uh, it does demand again uh, looking from a distance, but also close-up viewing, and that <clears throat> it is divided uh, into a series of horizontal levels. So the, in, the, in the middle of the top of the drawing is, uh, the, uh, is, a, um, is a series of, um, of personally meaningful objects. It's a kind of tableau. And there is a slate uh, uh, with uh, Arabic inscribed uh, on it, uh, Islamic text, which uh, flows calligraphically um, in the upper section. And um, this is a slab which uh, lies next to my bed, even uh, still to, to this day. And on it is a small black lingam, uh, which is a small stone, uh, a number of conical weights from Delphi in Greece, a small Ming bowl that belonged to a close friend who, di who died, and ar an arrangement of leaves along the edge which allude to still lives both of Gauguin and of Prella. Below a series of lines that are ruled across uh, the drawing, there's a yellow orange which um, suffuses the whole field. And there's a ghostly image of the Islamic steel slab just below that. And um, there is, a, there is a, a radiance that is eminent uh, in all the objects that are represented uh, below that uh, relate to the objects above. So these are these parallel worlds uh, which I'm interested in. I'm interested in the energy that uh, underlies form and is perceived in other ways. So scientists, for instance, uh, say that uh, everything vibrates while mystics describe um, the same phenomena by saying that everything has a sound. And so it's the same perception, uh, it's just different words. My focus as an artist um, has over a lifetime been on attempting to understand the complexities of human consciousness, of shared capacities that enable us to look further and deeper into the material and immaterial world. 
So at present, I work with 30 of the world's great astronomers looking out into the universe, a project that I've been working on for the last 10 years. So I attempt to understand the energetic complexities that underlie the manifest world. And Sorry, uh, Carl, you're very, very quiet. It's difficult to hear you. Is, is there something uh, you can do about it? Speak uh, up a bit. Can you hear me better? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me any better? Yes. Thank you, I'm sorry. So I've been interested in sacred art, um, but also how the values of a society are deeply manifest in the art that they produce. So if one spends time decoding work like Kula has been doing today, one, uh, it, it reveals the, quite accurately what is happening in a society. So the collection that I think you've put together, Kula, you know, talks to um, the uh, collective chronicling of our country and in many ways points to the predicaments, you know, that we have shared in the nation. And so it's, it's always fascinating to see how very different the artists work. Um, my work has never been, uh, has never really been political. Uh, but I've always been deeply interested in art that is political um, and uh, that w one doesn't mutually exclude the other. Uh, I always say that I'm delighted that both um, that Blake and Hogarth worked in, in, uh, in Britain, that one sees these two very different views of the world. So my work has always been a bit of an anomaly within the South African situation. So maybe we could look at Paul's hmm. work. Yeah, and just to, just to give you a quote, what Paul, I found that he brought, Paul says, here, yeah, drawing is one way of articulating my relationship to the world. Um, and yeah, just, just to say that Paul is a South African now living in the United States. He politically, his politically charged work was suppressed in his native country by the apartheid government and he left for the United States in 1988. I don't know if Paul is in the audience. He said he might be, but if he is, hi, hi, Paul. And so, Carl, I think you could carry on talking. I mean, that, that this work is the, the detective is in the SABC art collection. And then for the purposes of this talk by Carl, we've put the Biko drawings and, and Alchemist in. Okay, Carl, you, yeah, you carry on. So could, on. could we go back to the first uh, Biko drawings? Thank you. Um, That's right. That's perfect. So um, I talked uh, with Paul uh, Stopforth at Witz, um, in the early years before he left uh, for Boston. And I was deeply struck by the pathos, the power and the incisiveness of his work and his engagement with the world. He and Mick Goldberg were involved in the running of the market gallery and both made rem a remarkable contribution as artists, engaged in the struggle, focused on the political, with both dedication and insight. I was particularly moved by Stop for series of drawings of the activist um, um, Steve Biko. Here you see a drawing uh, from the series. And Biko was killed in detention and in the two works that uh, we are looking at this and the next one, one sees um, the steely precision of Stopforth's drawing of the details of Biko's damaged body. Stopforth's works um, are evocative and they're provocative. He intently in incises his lines through the soft graphite dusted uh, wax. So he has a wax surface and then he, he dusts it with graphite and then works with a pin through it. So it has a, an amazing uh, forensic clarity to it. The inverted tones uh, seem to capture the quality of a black and white photographic uh, negative with the innate allusions to the irre irrefutable evidence, um, the evidence of the dispassionate cruelty of the engulfing politics of the time in which he was working. 
I think both Stopforth and Goldberg um, were the first two artists for me actively engaged with political issues uh, to produce work with a visual and a moral power without the works being propagandistic or illustrative or journalistic. Issues that uh, really challenged uh, many of the generation that followed in trying to deal with the political. We can have a look at the next image. Uh, so just uh, prior to uh, stop forth leaving for Boston, like any true artist, there was a sense of self-doubt. And uh, he started, he changed his work quite radically. And you see detective on the left-hand side, how um, stop forth started painting. The, the, co the color changes dramatically and you can see the influence of Robert Hodgins. Uh, for me, what is quite humorous about the this painting is that, well, firstly, I think it's, it has an ironic quality to it. It has a cartoonesque quality, but um, that the detective in the top right-hand corner looks distinctly like uh, Trump uh, or Boris uh, Johnson. And uh, we start to see uh, a, uh, an illustrative mode, uh, which uh, Stopforth uses uh, very powerfully to create images that have a, a retinal strength, which you see on the, on the right-hand side in his work, The Alchemist, where it has now become extremely linear and uh, the, what looks like a decorative element is really related to the phosphenes, to the energy very often seen in, with the mind's eye, where you have this uh, powerful sense of patterning if you rub your eyelids and one has the hands uh, um, in this kind of mudra or position um, in the center of, of the painting. And behind that, of course, a primate skull looks like a baboon. And beyond that, we see these lotus blooms. And uh, Stopforth has become much more interested in, a, in an internal process of thinking and working which is diametrically opposed to the very early works that he undertook. But it's uh, always fascinating to see the life's journey uh, really very clearly demarcated within the work. Thank you, Kula. Thank you, Carl. That was wonderful. Thank you. So we're going to move um, on to um, Lawrence from Wana. Um, sorry, just give me a minute. Um, Laura, is Lawrence there? Lawrence, are you here? Hi, I'm here. Hi, I can't see yes. you. Oh. Okay, um, uh, Lawrence, welcome. Um, Lawrence is a visual artist and a lecturer at UNISA, and he also worked briefly at the SABC, I don't know for how long, a year or so, Lawrence? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. Until, yeah, until the end of 2007. And that's yes. where I got to know Lawrence. And we bought these two works, Hierarchy of Color, um, um, slide number 76 and 77. And he's added a few more, three, four more works so that he can talk about them. And what was interesting when I chatted to Lawrence, he was wanting, he was saying, you were saying that masculinity and heterosexuality were being eclipsed, or you felt it was being eclipsed, by the LGBTQ+, um, and that um, the gagged voice is actually what you were interested in. And I'm also very interested to hear, because there's your, your colors, um, your textures, um, a lot of it is anything but masculine in a way. Um, but I actually want to hear from you. I think everybody will want to hear um, the story. I think maybe let, let's begin with looking at uh, slide number 80, because that's I think that's um, um, as a kind of way of contextualizing how I began. Um, it's the, yeah. So that was one of the, the, um, the, the first kind of bodies of work that I did. It was um, an exhibition called um, Players of Color. And the work actually was born from my um, youth where I um, 
I went to a, what we used to call Model C schools in this country and, um, and living in the township. And I, and I found that there was like this kind of interesting kind of duality within that space um, where, um, where you are in the northern suburbs, you speak in a particular way, you behave in a particular way, and then you kind of almost have to code switch when you go to the township and, and, and kind of obtain another um, kind of sense of being. And so I was playing with, with those um, kind of elements. But I think the, the, the core of my work actually came um, with looking at my experience when I, when I played rugby. Um, and, and I was kind of fascinated with looking at myself through how I was perceived in this, you know, historically white sport, at least in this country. Um, and, and trying to kind of like look at this, what we call, what we were called lapis or morphies, because we did not fit the kind of hegemonic male structure that was like present in, in rugby. So that's kind of what, what catapulted my, my work in questioning this notion of masculinity or hegemony and so on. And then, um, so that was like basically how I kind of started the work. And then if you go to slide number maybe 77 or 76, um, I think, yeah. And um, so um, in, in 2008, uh, 2007, um, the, the name Jacob Zuma was like um, quite big in this country. Um, I think it was when he was deputy president and he, um, he was um, accused of rape. And, um, and, and, and I found that uh, kind of um, subject quite interesting, the, the role of masculinity within these kind of spaces. Um, and I looked at, at Jacob Zuma uh, not as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a personality, but as a subject, as a, as a kind of uh, point of inquiry um, about what it means to kind of be a man. And so um, if we go back to uh, maybe slide number 70, uh, 78. Um, uh -huh. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of move you around cause it's, it's kind of uh, uh, slide number 78. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and so I, I kind of wanted to look at different ways of looking at, at, um, uh, this figure Jacob Zuma that was like quite prominent in, in, in society and um, and one of the the most interesting things that I encountered was a book called things fall apart by um, Chino Achebe and um, and the book um, speaks about a figure who um, experiences masculinity in one way and and then um, the British come in and then they kind of um, um, uh, what do you call it transform what it means to be a man in that society. And I found that to be quite an interesting kind of, um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, link between the figure of Jacob Zuma, a very celebrated figure. And, and, I, and, I, and I was quite interested in how, for example, even in the media, he was described as charming. He was described as being somebody who is, um, who, yeah, who's charming. And, 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 and then he became a villain. And that was for me quite an interesting kind of narrative. And then, um, so that text and looking at headlines. Um, if you go to slide number 77, Willem. Uh, um, uh, uh, slide number 77, uh, the, the, um, yeah. Um, so that, that, that tied in with, again, looking at the popular image, the kind of populist kind of image of Jacob Zuma um, created a, a kind of like interesting kind of portrait. And so I started kind of like looking at headlines, looking at how the figure is kind of constructed in the media, and of course our consumption of it. Um, the the newsmaker of the year uh, was born from 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 him being named newsmaker of the year um, on 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 all our media houses in in that year 2008. And I found that to be quite an interesting kind of um, um, element in in a society that like we are drawn to these problematic. Um, figures and they become the stars, they become the, the people that we uh, focus on the most. And I found that to be quite interesting and informing my own kind of uh, experience. So, so the work was kind of derived on those kind of um, steps of looking at how people are formed in society, how we think about them, and also our, our, our assumptions. But those assumptions were informed by looking at um, the readings of Stuart Hall, 
and how the media is 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 kind of responsible for defining personalities uh, in terms of how they are presented and uh, and and that's basically where I, I kind of um was looking at my work and, and kind of questioning that and then of course there's a, the, the the fabrics that, that i use um the the for example music Make of the year is is a is a fabric called the palu and the the, the palu is used by by um sangomas it's 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 meant to be a spiritual kind of um um uh, uh fabric but I was I was drawn to the idea that um, um, during the rape trial, Jacob Zuma said that um, the woman was wearing a, a kanga, which um, for him signified consent, and 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 that made me really interested in also how kangas are, are used and read. And what is interesting um, for me was that kangas in South Africa are not used in that way as 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 as, as uh, what do you call it as. Um, things to read or, or signify as they, they're used in, 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 in a kind of very uh, specific kind of uh, context, um, religious context. But then when you look at kangas are used in, in East Africa, um, they are used as, 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 as uh, devices for communication. And so that for me became also like a really interesting kind of um, um, thread to kind of look at how appropriation um, actually operates in, in, in society. And, and that's how the, the work was, was constructed. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Lawrence. It's cool. fascinating. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on. I know we're running really out of time. Paul, are you there? So we'd like to welcome Paul again, but he seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Brilliant. I think I was I was muted. Sorry, I don't know why. Uh, let's go to slide number sixty-two. So, Paul, yeah, I met Paul at the Bag Factory when I was director. Then it was like early days. Paul, I think your work was this work number eighty-three, is the first your first yeah. work that came into a collection. I remember coming into your studio and they were up on the west wall, all in little single frames. And I rem remembered saying to you, we spoke about it a bit and said, why didn't you put them in one big frame, like a film? Because your life since then, and you did that, has been like an unrolling film. I always just said to you, Paul, is this your coming out work? And you looked at me and you said, how did you know? Or how do you know? Anyway, here's your whole history, your wonderful delicacy, which, I, I can't, uh, you know, I, I get so, I can't believe that anyone can work so beautifully, like, it's almost like the sand would hurt you if you were to touch it. So, I want you to talk about that work and the work that you've lent us for this talk, um, if you will. Okay. Um, well, Thank you for having me. Uh, can you guys hear me? I often get complaints that my voice is too soft, so <clears throat> I'm going to try and <clears throat> speak up. Um, you're absolutely right, Quilla. The um, Vault of Breath was kind of like a coming out work, although I, I absolutely didn't really, I wasn't really sure about that at the time. Um, it was certainly the first landscape I'd ever done. I had used to be, I was doing tiny little etchings of, of, of of sleeping faces and then all of a sudden there was this this large scale work that popped out of nowhere and um i think <clears throat> thinking about it today um something struck me this morning when i was thinking about what i was going to say today and the vault of breath was was done at a time when i well it's because it's it's actually from a dream it's, it's a dream image. It's it's a it's something that I saw in a dream and decided to put on paper. And I had never done that before. I, I'd always had quite a clear idea of what I was going to do. And suddenly, working from something that I'd seen in a dream was very scary for me. I it, it's just an intuition. It's not. It doesn't have a clear sort of end point of what it was going to mean or signify or be in, in an exhibition. And that's why I found it quite scary to do something like this just out of the blue. And um, 
and Vault of Breath became this sort of film series that carried all the way through even to my Lost Men project, which is the slide before number 82. The idea of something on a washing line um, blowing in the wind in some kind of storm or, um, and that is something that, that Vault of Breath was the starting point for, for that theme that has kind of carried on through my work. Um, I don't know what else I, I was going to say, uh, and this is a new work that I've just recently done that I've scratched into carbon paper. Um, I love the, I, I call this a self portrait. Um, this is not part of the collection. It's, it's just a, a recent work that I've done. And um, it, I love carbon paper as this very fragile kind of material that's easily perforated with the blade. I'm scratching these images into the carbon paper um, with the blade. And, and if, the, if the carbon paper tears, I just leave it alone um, and let that tear become one of the marks in, in the work. Um, these are my own feet. I, it's a self-portrait, really. Um, and actually started out as an experiment. This is a, a lithograph that I did um, in, uh, I think it was around 2007 or eight. No, no, that was much later, 2011. Um, I was very fascinated with rites of passage for young men um, changing from one identity to another, especially going into the military. And I captured a few photographs of uh, white men um, having their heads shaved when they are inducted into the military. And this is a series of images that captures those moments. And I blanked out the heads because I like the idea of not knowing who this person was, who he is right in this instance that we see him and who he's about to become. Um, I think that the military has a lot of loaded connotations for South Africa, especially when thinking about our past in South Africa. Um, this is also a work that I scratched into carbon paper. That's one huge piece of carbon paper that I put together. And it's a, a portrait really of my father. Um, a f about a few months before he passed away, he was 93. He allowed me to photograph him, which at 93, was not an easy task for me to convince him to let me do. Um, my dad was very conservative. He was Lebanese. And um, he thought I was just being too arty, really. He, 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 it was really a difficult thing. But eventually he, he let me. He let me photograph him um, naked with no clothes on. And I spent a year scratching these images of his body into the carbon paper and I was my father was very religious Christian uh, Lebanese not Muslim and um, the image of the shroud was such a strong thing for me growing up in all Catholic boys school and um, I, I felt that capturing his image in this way was a kind of a way almost to subvert that sort of icon, that sort of relic of, of, of Christianity that's so important, um, just with, with my father's image. And all of the dust that you see at the bottom is the, I collected the, the carbon powder at the end of every day when I was drawing, and that's become part of the work. Um, hmm. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Beautiful, Paul. I also forgot, I didn't forget, I just must mention um, that Paul is part of the um, curric school curriculum now, and congratulations, Paul, on that. Yeah. And also um, your exhibition at WAM, um, Men and Monuments, which I sadly haven't seen, and we've got to make a plan that I can sneak in and have a look at it. But that you're going to be on a, what, another Zoom, Strauss Zoom with Julia. Um, yes, that's it's a, a on the 29th. Yeah. Yeah. So that mustn't be missed. 
and also you on Latitudes, which was launched today online. So we look forward to that as well. Hmm. Thanks for having me, Carla. <laughs> Um, um, so we'll move to Sam. Is Sam there? Yeah. Sam, I can't find him. Ah, there you are, Sam. Can you unmute yourself? Um, yeah. There we are. Hi, know? Sam. Hi. Um, Sam and Tengeshwa, you probably don't need much of an introduction. Um, certainly, um, I knew Sam as well from the Bag Factory Artist Studio. Um, and his, I think you studied at, at, at Bill Ainsley as well, didn't you, Sam? Yes, I did. Yeah. I can't hear, Sam, I can't hear you much. Okay. 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 Can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you. Um, Sam, Sam um, is one of the artists. We, we've been trying to build a trajectory of a body of work of a few artists. And Sam is one of them, as is Paul, Diane, Victor. There's, there are quite a few artists, Tracy Rose. And if we, we've got quite a few slides of yours here. Um, and if we can just run through them, Sam, and then you can choose to talk about all of them. This particular work, one of my favorites, Midnight Blue, if you can go back to it. Where did you say it went on loan abroad some years ago? Yeah, hi, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to be quick because time is also not on my side. Oh, sorry. Well, okay. I think like, uh, I think jazz is part of my life. Jazz is part of this, this work is sitting in the CFO's office, and I hope she's here. She's a wonderful supporter, Yolandi von Bulen, of our collection. So let's hope we'll get money for more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, jazz is part of my life, and uh, it happened that while I was at the bag factory, I, I started to sort of like create this, this, this piece, uh, which was um, titled Midnight Blue. And uh, for, for everyone's information, it was selected by the curator, Lori, uh, at SCAT. It was shown in Atlanta, um, when was it? Savannah and Atlanta when? I think around uh, 10 years ago or so. And, and it, it, was, it was well received. But I think um, it's, it's, it's becoming one of my popular pieces and um, Yes, um, can we move to the next one? Uh, this, this particular one it's about, because you know, um, uh, all my subjects, I always try to, 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 to be involved. Like uh, the jazz pieces, I go to jazz labs, I, I, I'm friends to musicians. To me, it makes it easy for me to execute a piece because I've been to the environment. Uh, with this piece, it's been like, I, I went uh, on a mind trip when I did that show, 1997, 96, a mind trip. And I had the opportunity to go underground, which was not pleasant at all. And uh, I happened to sort of like uh, engage with various miners and ask them several things. But um, this piece that is, um, I would say well done to SABC via Kula to collect this piece. This is exactly what I discovered about the guys in the mines. You know, you wouldn't sort of like uh, see any happy face because for them, the focus was to, to, to work and to get out. The only time is like when one is chatting to his other party and maybe there's something that makes them to laugh. But most of the time I saw these serious faces underground. And later it was made to be a, a tapestry. So the beer hall, the beer hall, it's, it's, it's such a sad uh, situation because uh, it reminded me as being one of the students that were protesting in 1976. Uh, the beer halls, that's where our mothers would say, go to this beer hall, you'll find your father and please tell him that he must be home on time, etc." So you 
we find a group of men having enjoying their beer in a beer hall, like having serious conversations. There was little similar. There was so much similarity between the beer halls and the shabins because that's where men uh, gather together. And not only to just go and get drunk, because like uh, they would sort of like discuss social political events, they would discuss music, jazz, etc. And you'll find so many intellectuals out of those those spaces. So I, when I when I did this piece about the beer hall, maybe 200, 300 meters from my parents' house, there was a popular beer hall in White City, Guatemala. So when that was brought down during the time of our protest in 76, that structure is still there, but it's no longer a beer hall, it's something else. But it had those memories about knowing what our fathers, our uncles were enjoying or doing there. But time was there for us to sort of like deal and make them to live a more positive life than together and sort of like under that roof of at the beer hall. So I was part of that group that was was protesting during 1976. Yeah, on, another sad story in our lives. I mean, we all know about Sharpville shooting. I mean, people wanted their rights, but I mean, who during that time would sort of like stand toe to toe with uh, the apartheid regime. We tried to sort of like made our voices yet, but uh, guns were there to silence us. So this is, this is one, of, one of those saddest moments that peaceful people were just like, who were not even carrying guns, which sort of like their lives were ended like that. Can we move on? The pass rates. Pass rates has been like part, of, part and parcel of, uh, of us. I remember when I was like um, studying at uh, at, at uh, Bill Ainsley's uh, at foundation. Bill Ainsley used to get calls all the time about some artists who didn't make it to their homes because, like, they were just arrested after leaving the art foundation because you're not supposed to be at the at the suburb at that particular time. So, yeah. Jobek. Jobek has been like an inspiration to me because like I've been part and parcel of the city. I mean, the congestion of the city is what really inspires me. And like, I can't, I can't live three, three years without getting inspiration about doing something about the cityscapes. And this is the era of the 50s and the 60s, which I once said to people that to me, there's so much that really fascinated me about 50s and the 60s, be it the buildings, be it design cars, I mean, furniture, uh, clothes. So there's something that the designers of that era did something. And we're still enjoying some of the good, good, good things that were products of that era. Even the music of the 50s and the 60s, you can talk about John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Charles Mingus, Ella Fitzgerald. 50s and the 60s to me will forever be my inspiration. So this is Josie, JBS around that era. Man reading a newspaper. Nothing much I can say about this. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, it was like, um, just the previous one. Yes, I, I somewhere in, in, in near Jamestown, I went there to go and do sketches of the farm laborers. So this is one of the drawings that uh, I produced from there. These were the drawings that I did, charcoal drawings that I did uh, at Rockstrift, the two charcoal drawings that I did at Rockstrift. And I think this was a shed where we, we used to put uh, wood for, for making fire. And uh, yeah, because like, um, Drawing was a daily practice under Jules van der Rive at Rock Street. You must go and do sort of like, which is, which is something that really made me probably to have better skills in drawing because I was taught by two great uh, uh, tutors, Bill Ainsley and, uh, and uh, Jules van der Rive, because they said you can't be an artist without knowing how to draw. So, yep. 
I think this was part of the townships visited, revisited. I think somewhere in Mbumalanga, I did, I did a piece about uh, the mamas going to church. The goats, the goats, uh, <laughs> it's another subject because like, you know, I used to ask myself, why always you see like people dragging goats to be slaughtered, etc. But I think uh, I got the message that when you consult a Sangoma or etc., you'll be told that you need to slaughter a goat so that you can have a brighter future. So this has been another story that really fascinated me about black goats. I started to sort of like focus about, about doing series of black goats. And this one is my favorite one, the one on the left. It's my most favorite one. You call it loneliness, you learn to eat it. It's loneliness because it was wandering. All the goats were sort of like in a group. And then this one was wandering on its own. I said, loneliness. Well done and thank you. Beautiful collection. Thank you, uh, uh, Hello, we are away time. Would you like to have the last word? I just want to thank everyone and speakers. And Can you hear me? Can hear you, yes. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. And I and the next this next slide is just to um, remind or to, to um, Wilhelm, if you can show the next slide, it's to just say that if anyone wants to come to our it's about art tours, please email me or get my phone number. Um, and also, we our website should up, be up and running again soon. Um, thank you. I'm sorry we went so over time. Um, we'll, have, yeah. well, thank you very much. Um, we did go a bit over time, but obviously there's, this will be up tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So if anybody did have to leave, they can catch up. Um, but thank you very much. It was very insightful. It was really wonderful to go through the collection and in such detail. Um, so thank you very much, Kula. And thank you very much to our guests, Sam, Paul, Carl, uh, Lawrence, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your insights and sharing your knowledge. Um, we really do appreciate it. And it's just, it's, it's wonderful for all of us um, to hear and experience um, the full collection. So thank you very much. And thank you, Wilhelm, for putting together the presentation and taking us through it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me too. Big thanks to everybody from my side as well. Most enjoyable, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Willa. <laughs> Bye. And nice then, evening. Bye. Oh. Okay, and then just to uh, recap that tomorrow we will be um, having a talk on the 1940s. We'll be